Hi there, my name is Kitty Waitley. I'm a mezzo-soprano and I was supposed to be playing Sesto in English Touring Opera's production of Giulio Cesare by Handel this season before the entire tour very sadly had to be cancelled due to the COVID-19 outbreak. Unlike many of my colleagues in the opera industry, I've been very fortunate that ETO have found the funds to be able to pay all of their freelance artists for the season that they should have been taking part in. This is a huge relief to us and uh, we are absolutely indebted to the company for finding the way to do this. Uh, I know a lot of my colleagues in the opera industry are really, really struggling uh, as a result of so much cancelled work and not being paid for that work. So uh, in order to give something back to the company, my colleagues and I are very, very happy to be taking part in a series of online resources that English Touring Opera have suggested uh, to provide some interesting online content for their audiences uh, in place of the wonderful season that had been planned. Myself today, I'm going to talk to you about how I approach a role, how I, I start learning a role, specifically my role, Sesto. I was very lucky to be in this production when it was first mounted in 2018 and uh, delighted to be coming back to it. Um, so I'm all the more heartbroken that it's had to be cancelled. In 2018, we performed the entire opera uncut, which is very unusual for Giulio Cesare. It's a long piece. It's a fantastic piece full of some of the absolute treasures of, of the whole canon but um, it is a long night for the performers and it's a long night for the audience. So uh, last time round, we performed it in, in two parts over two consecutive nights or on a Saturday, the whole thing in one hit, um, which was major and fantastic and wonderful. And we loved it and the audiences loved it. But this time round, ETO chose to condense the opera into one evening's worth. Um, so that it could go alongside the other operas that had been programmed, which were Cosi Fan Tutte by Mozart and Bach's St John Passion, and their fantastic opera for um, specifically for very young children and children with special needs, uh, The Extraordinary Adventures of You and Me. So the first major change in the 2020 production of Cesare was the cuts. Um, my first challenge was to get my head around what had gone and what that meant for my character and the geography of my character's journey. Often I find revivals of operas that have happened before can be a little bit artistically unsatisfying. Um, often it's an assistant director working from the book, the, the score from last time round, and it, you have a lot less time to put the show together than you will have when it was a new production. So it will be, you know, you stand over there, she goes there, he, he does this, and uh, it's a little bit mechanic, um, sometimes mechanical. Sorry. Um, sometimes you'll just be given the DVD in a couple of days to watch that and learn the moves and on you go. Um, so I was really, really pleasantly surprised to find that this time um, it was not going to be like that. James Conway, our director, wanted to work in just as much detail um, as we had done in 2018. Because it was largely a, a new cast, he had gave us a lot of freedom and it gave the cast a lot of space to make it their own rather than trying to replicate exactly what we'd done before. So in some ways it felt like we were putting on a new production altogether, um, but within the confines of the set and the costumes that we'd had in 2018, which was wonderful. The only drawback, I guess, for me was that I still remembered quite a lot of the blocking from last time around. Um, so it took my old brain um, a little bit of time to get used to the changes. So there were quite a lot of mistakes made. Um, I really enjoyed recreating this role. James, working with James Conway, our director, is always really enjoyable. He's very, very thorough, deeply intelligent. He does a huge amount of research into the, the operas that we'll be doing and the, the period that they've chosen to set it in. Um, and it, we'll do a lot of talking before we um, get into blocking. The first step for learning an opera in a foreign language is to make sure that uh, you absolutely understand every word of what you're saying and every nuance of the language and every, um, every word that everybody around you is saying, which is a big job. 
So the first job you have to do is go through your score and write in every single word in English. And that's not just a general translation of roughly what you're saying in each bit, but a word for word translation of exactly what every word means and what every word of everybody else's text means. Luckily for me, I did that in 2018, so I didn't need to do that again. So that was one step I could miss out. The next step for me was going through the score and making sure I had marked up all the cuts so that I knew what was gone in 2020. Another thing that singers like to do um, when they are procrastinating and trying to avoid actually doing the work that's needed to learn an opera is to go through the score and colour it in with our nice colours to uh, highlight our own line, which is pretty pointless and not really necessary, but it makes you feel like you've done some work. So once your score is all prepared and ready, the next step is to take the music to co coaches and uh, singing teachers. Luckily for me, this time round, I had hundreds of recordings on my phone of all the coachings and singing lessons and language coachings and rehearsals uh, from 2018. So again, that saved me quite a lot of um, money and time. I think um, often people don't realise how much money singers have to spend up front in preparing a role uh, or preparing any music. Um, it's easy to think that we are um, overpaid for turning up and singing some songs, um, but I assure you um, not very many people in this industry are overpaid and um, the when you work it out on an hourly rate, including all the preparation, it doesn't work out as very much. So um, if you can see this, you, know, you can get a vague idea of the number of hours of preparation that went into this. Um, this, these are recordings of me learning the recits on my own with my appalling piano skills. Uh, singing lessons I had with two different singing teachers. Coachings I had with um, Jane Robinson at English Touring Opera. Language lessons with Matteo and uh, Isabella. Um, one wonderful thing in 2018 was that uh, English Touring Opera gifted us two uh, coaching sessions each with Dame Anne Murray on this music, which was an absolute honour and wonderful. And uh, Anne very kindly permitted me to record that. So I still have all that on here from last time round. So that was fantastic to be able to revisit that. I've got coaching sessions with Jonathan Peter Kenny recorded from last time, our conductor. Um, I've got our Zitzporben, which are the rehearsals that we do with orchestra before we go to stage rehearsing. Um, so I had all the, the speeds there and uh, reminders of how it sounds with orchestra. So that was an absolute blessing to have all that still on my phone. Um, but it gives you an, an idea of just how much preparation goes into these um, rehearsals before we even start uh, official rehearsals. Um, we've already spent a huge amount of our own money and time uh, in the preparation. The next stage is to memorise the music and the only way to do that really is just to practice, 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 which uh, we do a huge amount of, again, uh, recorded in that app, is hours worth of, of um, practice. I will quite often record myself practising and listen back and give myself feedback, make notes on that. Sometimes I'll record myself and talk to myself so that I can listen back on um, on the tube or in my car or whatever and uh, keep trying to feed my brain with um, preparation. Another way that I memorise is by writing out my part over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. So my house is full of these notebook books um, where you'll find pages and pages of legible writing where I've just written and written and written and written my part over and over and over again and uh, somehow I find that that helps me and uh, something to do with the muscle memory of my hand and my brain, I don't know what it is, but uh, that's one of the ways that I try and memorise things. The next stage is to try to remember the blocking for me, in, in this case, um, obviously not in a new production, but in a revival, um, I, I didn't know that uh, James was going to be um, re-blocking, so I thought I'd better prepare myself um, but before day one of rehearsals by watching the DVD, which was excruciating and horrible to see myself, as I'm sure this will be, and by um, 
visiting, revisiting my score where um, I will have written in a lot of the the blocking. Um, <clears throat> for instance, here she takes the dagger, turn and watch their ritual. Back to the audience. So every line. Um, I probably will have written it into my score, so I went back and revised all that. The next stage is to give some thought to your character. I think it's always useful to give your character a bit of a backstory. Again, luckily I had done all that last time and still had it all written down. So um, I had given my character Sesto a big backstory. Um, I think I had done that actually halfway into the rehearsals when I already had an idea of what James wanted to do with this character. I've uh, I've really loved this production because James um, and I have come up with this version of Sesto which is quite uh, bookish and sensitive and quiet and rather than a, a sort of aggressive soldier type which I think is, is fascinating and gives the character a much bigger journey to go on from this, this young, naive boy to the assassin that he becomes and how he arrives at that. Um, so at some point in the rehearsals, I wrote my backstory, I can't find it now, somewhere here, um, where I thought about where he'd come from, what his life had been like in the run-up to the start of the opera, how he related to the characters that we see him with, his mother mainly, how he relate, to, how he felt about the characters that he's going to meet, Giulio Cesare, for example, how he felt about his late father before his father died, what their relationship was like, whether he had siblings, um, where he had been just before his first entry into the opera, um, and then to go through every scene and make sure that I had given that thought to each scene so before I come on stage at any point where have I come from what do I want why am I coming here again I'd written all that down so I could just revise that rather than having to do the work this time which was bad also for example here scene one this is my first entry I've written we enter stage right following mother I'm trying to be a man mother has rehearsed this conversation with me Cesare is not to be trusted we've come to ask for father's life and for my inheritance and not to beg um, so I've given myself um, some notes about how I'm feeling before we come in and uh, what we've come to achieve. So I've got notes like that for every scene. One of the challenges with Handel particularly is that uh, it's very long and there's a lot of time to fill. Arias contain a lot of repeti repeated text and a lot of music uh, in which you're not singing, uh, which needs to be filled with energy and emotion. So for each aria, I have notes on how I'm feeling in the, in the music, in the non-sung music. Um, so for example, this is one of my arias, uh, Langue Feza. I have um, my feelings about part one, my feelings about part two. Uh, so for example, in part one, I'm already apprehensive. I barely recognize my mother. Um, my mother's behaving crazily. Um, I don't know what to do um, and then notes on the blocking there and then going into part two this is more positive hope is returning my mother's going to be proud of me and uh, notes on the blocking of that here I have um, a page of notes on um, one of my arias which was actually cut this time uh, but in 2018 this was the aria La Giustizia I have a page of notes on uh, I, I, I think this will have been notes that I received from the music staff and language uh, coaches um, so I've got corrections on certain parts of my Italian um, and which I've written in phonetic symbols this is how we um, annotate our, uh, our pr pronunciation. So here I've written la vendetta, not uh, not to open, not to air. Eh. So make sure I'm not, so I must have been singing la vendetta instead of la vendetta and somebody has given me a note to remember that. Also notes on the music, um, looks like I've written out a section of music um, where I needed to remember certain things. For example, I must remember to breathe there, a tick for me is a symbol that I need to breathe at a certain point in the bar. Um, 
I probably rung certain areas to remind myself that that's a tricky moment or um, maybe that note is coming out out of tune so I need to pay more attention to that note so I'll have written that out. So for all my arias I've got um, pages like this of things that I needed to remember. So that was very useful to come back to as well. So I hope that's been interesting for you to see some of the ways in which we prepare a role before you get to see it, uh, before anybody gets to see it. This, these are the steps that we take before we even get into a rehearsal space. I think one of the one of the most enjoyable things about opera as opposed to recital work, which is a, another vein of what I do, is that you do have the time and the space to experiment and play. Um, so I really like to um, work as hard as I can to make sure I, I know it inside out so that we can use the time uh, in the rehearsals to, to play with it and um, find different ways of, of doing it. And the final preparation I had to do for this role was to dye my hair dark brown because uh, I don't think an early 18th century boy would have had crazy red hair. Um, so that was that. So uh, once the tour was sadly cancelled, the only silver lining to that cloud was that I was able to go back to my crazy red. It's it's a tragedy for all of us that this tour's had to be cancelled, um, of course. It's a terrible situation for everybody across the entire planet and uh, there's not much more that I can say really other than that um, I'm hugely, hugely grateful to English Touring Opera uh, in so many ways. It's been a wonderful company to be a part of for the last 10 years of my career. They've, um, I've had some of my, my most invaluable training by being part of the English Touring Opera's productions and learnt so much. And uh, uh, the fact that they've been able to pay us for this season despite having all of the the venues cancelled as uh, is just an uh, I don't I can't I can't convey how grateful we are um, as freelance artists for that I hope that this has been an interesting video and um, I'm sure there'll be more I know that my colleagues are busy putting together lots of really interesting material and uh, perhaps I'll be back with something more uh, bye for now <laughs>